Check. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Surprise, a little different than you used to yeah. Dropping these bars on YouTube Knowledge I introduce you yeah. We chasing this money like it's the prize It's the voodoo From Gazy through Gazi It's just a lie we buying into uh, yeah. We need some cars on deck yeah. Get the rollies, get the moe All the Mars on deck Alright, um, good evening everyone And let me just uh, get all of this absolutely spot on There we go, alright, so I did kind of allude to the fact that I'm away um, this week, so everything is going to look and sound very, very different. This definitely looks different. This looks different. The sound is very different to what you've probably come accustomed to as well, because I didn't travel with all of my kit. Uh, so I'm doing some work uh, in Dubai at the moment. So I'm going to be here until Monday. I fly back on well, I fly back on Sunday, back on Monday uh, morning. But um, in the meantime, obviously, off the back of the live on Sunday, we had a really good conversation with um, Charlie uh, from Moving Homes with Charlie um, about, obviously, what's going on, this whole thing. We spoke about what the role of the government is and so on and so forth. So today, what I wanted to do is focus a little bit on some really pivotal dates and some pivotal numbers, uh, because I think more than anything else, it will be nice if we're just aware of what might be coming down the track so we can prepare. And that's the purpose of this live. It's not to scare anybody. It's not to put uh, people in a compromising position. If anything, I want you to be in the best position possible. So I'm gonna run through uh, the numbers that we need to be paying attention to. There is a magic number, 8.3%. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that uh, and maybe talk a little bit about maybe preparedness, making sure that you're prepared uh, yourselves if things don't go the way we hope that they will. Um, and the track record so far hasn't been great. So I'm a little bit of a pessimist on this one, if I'm completely honest. Before we dive in, um, please make sure that you smash the like button. Again, it's it takes you one second, but it just means that other people who are likely to benefit from this conversation by listening to it will also get to see it as well, because the YouTube algorithm will push it to them. And if you haven't already subscribed, uh, subscribe, please. Um, it's really uh, great to see the subscriber number uh, increase. Um, we're at uh, 41,687, I believe it is right now. Uh, it would be great to get it to maybe about 750 by the end of the week, but I'm not too affixed on those numbers, although it's nice to have a lot of you here. But anyway, let's jump straight into it. So if you were paying attention to the live with Charlie on um, Sunday, we did cover quite a lot, but we did talk about inflation. Inflation has been the reason why we're in this predicament right now with the Bank of England base rate increasing and mortgage rates increasing. And we haven't really spoken too much about savings rate. I will do a video separately on that because I read somewhere and I didn't read the full article. I saw the head line that apparently there's a nine percent savings account out there somewhere i don't know who it's with but i'm gonna go and find out who it's actually with but um we did talk about inflation now inflation and the target for inflation as you know is two percent at this point in time we're at eight point seven percent um and the next um monetary policy committee meeting is going to be on august the third so it's 36 days away and at that point, what they're going to do is they're going to meet and they're going to try and get an understanding of what's going on with inflation. We will have a CPI check-in right before then. Now, this is the number that we need to aim, to, uh, aim for. And this is the number that the Bank of England is certainly going to be aiming for. And again, you've seen this on this channel. I keep coming back to this because it's really, really important because this gives us a snapshot of the forecast of where people want things to be. And these numbers do change. Only about three weeks ago, this number right here, which is our inflation rate, this is the forecast for Q2, was 7.5%. They revised this last week when they put up the Bank of England base rate to 8.3%. This right here is the magic number, 8.3%. If we get to um, August the 3rd, when the Monetary Policy Committee meets again and inflation does not go down from 8.7% right now to 8.3%, then we already know that they are going to consider 
pushing even further. And I did a live last week where I sp- uh, I went through the, the, the meeting summary notes. And in the summary notes, they expressly said that they're going to continue to, to monitor um, inflationary pressures within the economy. And if they find that there is still impre- inflationary pressures, they will continue to push. And again, Jeremy Hunt has been on record saying that he will support the Bank of England uh, pushing rates, even if it means that we go into a recession. And that in itself leads to a much, much bigger conversation. Now, if you did pay attention to the to the, to the the live with, uh, with Charlie on Sunday, we spoke about the role of the Bank of England and the government, right? Because people just assume that Jeremy Hunt, Rishi Sunak are telling Andrew Bailey and the Monetary Policy Committee, there's nine of them all together, what to do. And that isn't the truth. That's not how things work. So the Bank of England, which is their role is to make sure that they monitor inflation, they then dictate uh, monetary policy as a result of that. That's their job. They are a separate entity to the government. They cannot be influenced by Rishi Sunak. They cannot be influenced by Jeremy Hunt. If anything, I probably guarantee you right now, I was I saw some uh, bits of Rishi talking about inflation and he's saying, trust me, we're on this. And if he could have his way, I would argue that he probably would prefer that the Bank of England didn't put interest rates up even further because it does cause pain. And when you think about inflation, how convoluted and complex this entire... It's, it's like a... Have you ever had like a a ball of like elastic bands that just get that gets knotted up and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it's almost impossible to to get the individual elastic bands out when you bind them all together in a ball it's kind of like that everything's so intrinsically linked these days that you you pull one lever but the impact and the effect that it has can be so far so much more far reaching than you originally thought and so the government isn't controlling what these guys are doing. These guys are doing what they feel is right to bring down the inflation number. Now, I am a pessimist to a certain degree because up until, what, the last two months, we haven't seen any impact at all of all of the measures that the guys at the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey and the the Monetary Monetary Policy Committee have done. We've seen no impact until literally a couple of months ago when it fell from... Uh, 10.1 to 8.7, right? That's the first time we've seen a significant move in the inflation number. And I think what they've done now, as of last week, was they took the initiative to say, right, if we push an extra half a percent, hopefully that will act as the catalyst to get things down. Now, there are a number of things that go into the inflation number. And I'm sure that I already shared this on, uh, I think it was a live either last week or the week before. One of the big contributors to inflation has been the cost of energy, so gas and electric. And you've probably already now started to receive emails from your provider saying that your energy tariffs are going to be coming down because the cost of wholesale gas has been going down. And it takes about three months for that to filter through, and it's starting to filter through now to our household bills. So with the next CPI check, hopefully we're going to see the tangible impact of that on the inflation number, which it's probably one of those things that gives you hope that actually we will see the the inflation rate come down from 8.7 to 8.3. Now, is it going to be, is it going to have large enough of an impact that we're going to have to see? Because it isn't just about energy prices. Yes, it has been a, a large component of it, but it's not been the only deciding factor. But that is good news generally. And good news that we hope is going to filter through to help move that number a little bit closer. But 8.3 really is the number. And the date to bear in mind is August the 3rd. That's when the Monetary Policy Committee uh, meets again. Um, I just I was going to show you I've, I've already covered this on um, on one of the lives um, already. But I think maybe if I can let me see if I can find the minutes again, because I do just want to. I do just want to highlight um, the piece that I mentioned here in terms of the language that the Bank of England are actually using when they're um, talking about interest rates specifically. If I can find it, I will share it with you because I think it is very, very important. And people will say, you know, don't pay attention to the news and, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. And yes, you absolutely do need to take a lot of this stuff with a pinch of salt. But when when, when they have it in a written document 
as stuff that is being said, I think we do need to pay attention to it because ultimately what they're trying to do is they're trying to signpost. And I've mentioned this before. I can't find it now. I'm looking at the sum, uh, the policy summary, um, the meeting summary, sorry. And I can't remember which section it was on. Um, what I might do is I might link to the to the document. If you like to do reading and you're interested in the in the detail of this kind of stuff, I'd encourage you just to read it, just so that you can see the kind of language and how they're they're talking about this stuff. But if it's written in in, in paper, like in ink, it's there on a document that tells you that they're thinking a certain way. And look. Is this going to be an easy path? I don't think it is. I think it's going to be very, very difficult for a lot of people. Um, it's going to be really, really hard for a lot of people. And I, if there is no magic wand to fix this, I mean, someone said earlier, and let me just bring up this comment, by the way, because I don't necessarily disagree. Um, he said just before, actually, no, he has put it here as well. I mean, look at this. That could be where we end up potentially so everything really is riding on hopefully getting this 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 inflation number to 8.3 and even then dare i say even then the bank of england might decide to keep going anyway because we're still four times the rate of inflation and when you start looking at the forecast in terms of where you actually want this to to end up Look at the forecast that they're actually projecting here for um, inflation, because this is really, really important. We don't start to see inflation come down to anywhere ne near where it needs to be until much, 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 much later on. I mean, you're looking at Q1 in 2024 before we even get into the 2% range. And a lot of stuff has to happen between then and now. And the sad thing is that, you know, when you think about the impact of, you know, um, increase in interest rates. The biggest impact that it's going to have is on people's mortgages, right? And for renters, there is a knock-on effect for renters as well. If, you're, if your landlord sees his mortgage costs go up, he's probably going to try and pass that on to you as a renter. So not only are rents going up, mortgages are going up. Those are people's two biggest expenses most of the time, right? And then you add on things like car finance, personal loans, any personal debt that you have, food, gas, electric, cancel tax. If you have children, uh, child, child care fees. I mean, that can be astronomical. And all this is leading to, it's quite a blunt tool to do a really blunt job, increasing interest rates, because it, it, it exacerbates the squeeze that you've already felt during the cost of living crisis anyway. It makes that so much worse. And how this works is that, by increasing the interest rates, yes, mortgages go up, rents go up, all these other things go up. The whole idea is to encourage people to spend less. Well, what this will do now and what it's already doing is, is reducing people's disposable income. And so people will, will spend less, taking more money out of the system, and hopefully then meaning that the cost of the goods and services that we are buying basically come down and therefore reduce inflation. But there's also a lots of other factors that we can't even begin to legislate for to a certain degree and even where we find ourselves right now in terms of the borrowing rates for the government because the pound isn't deemed to be as strong as it used to be is it's pretty dire for the fact that now when we are importing things in to europe uh, in from europe into the uk with brexit also part of the equation now uh, with the extra custom taxes and so on and so forth well the cost of things coming into the country is has has risen in cost that contributes to inflation as well so there are so many moving parts here and like i've said monetary policy alone is a very 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 blunt tool to try and tackle all of this what we do need, and I don't mean to be political in any way, what we do need is we need some really good ideas from our politicians in terms of some economic stimulus for the economy to grow. And again, this is where you think, what are they thinking and how is this so counter counterintuitive? This interest rate rise might push us into a recession. And what we are looking for is we're looking for economic stimulus, economic plans to help us, you know, not go into a recession. So 
it's almost like they're they're working against each other, but they also need to be working hand in hand, if that makes any sense. It's it's pretty crazy right now. But look, that's what we know right now. And that's what I'm going to be monitoring. Um, I just think if you are in a position where, you, you know, you are you've got a mortgage. Look, I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. You really need to consider getting in front of a mortgage um, advisor right now and trying to fix as much as you can. Um, then the measures that they announced last week, I, I do need to do a video on that. I was on Sky talking about, uh, did they do anything new? Eh, not really. Not really. Was it really tangible? Mm, maybe when we deal into the into the detail of it, maybe there might be some nuances, some good stuff that comes out of the back of it. But look, I think, I think... I think they're all fresh out of ideas, if I'm completely honest. And that doesn't really um, inspire much confidence, um, especially when you start thinking about the fact that these are, we're putting our trust in politicians. And I said this last week, it doesn't matter how you vote or who you voted for or who you are going to vote for moving forward. You want to keep everything crossed that they get this right for our sakes, because if they get it wrong, you can argue Rishi and his mates, all of the MPs, all of the politicians, they're pretty wealthy. They'll be OK. They'll be able to, you know, deal with the rise of inflation and it probably won't even touch the sides. They'll feel it. Maybe they want, you know, they'll they'll adjust. OK, they'll be fine. Um, they're not going to lose their houses or, or, or struggle to pay their mortgage. Um, we will, though. Ordinary people will. And so it's. Isn't it so fucked up when you think of it that way? It's it's really messed up when you think of it that way, right? You're putting your hopes and your prayers in politicians who really don't have anything co in common with ordinary people. It's mad when you think of it that way. But anyway, there it is. Um, that's the live. Let me just have a look at the comments really quickly because I don't want this to run on for, for, for too long. Uh, let's have a look and see what you guys are saying. Let me just change over my peripheries really quickly so I can get this... Uh, incorrectly i'm working on a really small screen normally when i'm at home i have a 55 inch curve inch uh 55 inch curved screen and i can have different things open at different places i'm using my my i think my 15 13 inch laptop right now and normally where i have four or five different things open i don't have that much space to uh to move around so let me just uh move something here i need to change over to this one and then uh, let's have a look at some comments and hear what you guys are saying. Um, so we're saying here, Rishi's plan is to hold on, hold our nerves. Uh, do I feel sorry for them? I mean, it's, it is an impossible, it's almost an impossible situation. And this is where you need, like I said, you need really bright ideas. We need the clever people to come to the party, the clever people to come to the table and be like, right, this is the plan. It really pissed me off last week because one of the um, one of the headlines that came out last week after the uh, interest rate rise was um, an MP from Labour talking about how they needed to force the banks to do something. And I'm like, if that is the top, the pinnacle of our, of our ideas, then we are in some serious doo-doo, like serious doo-doo. We need better ideas than just force the banks to do this. And we did kind of talk about why the banks can't help mortgage holders, even if they wanted to very very briefly on the live on sunday i will actually do a separate video on that because i think people think it's much easier than it actually is and when you think about it if they did decide that they were going to help people even if they could there are consequences and the consequences are much closer to home than what a lot of people actually realize they are so oh, who knows eh who knows who knows who knows Oh my God, I jumped the uh, comments really quickly. Let me just go straight up to the top and try and get as many of these in as possible. I do appreciate you uh, guys being here as always. Um, let's have a look at this. So he says here, I think that the base rate um, has to exceed the inflation rate to be effective. And yes, the economy would collapse. We spoke about that on Sunday. I would not, I would not disagree. I mean, if you look at the uh, unemployment numbers right now, uh, let me just go back onto this screen right here. Um, the unemployment numbers, this is the forecast for unemployment right now. So we are at 3.8. Unemployment is forecast to rise. I think they're being very, very conservative with these numbers because depending on how severe it actually gets, how far they have to push interest rates, companies are going to start letting people go. So this, I mean, Charlie was saying that the STIG uh, was forecasting that perhaps um, the unemployment rate could actually double. And that would be scary stuff. But 
I think you're right there in terms of where um, the interest rate would probably have to go for it to be effective um, in the long run. But hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping that we don't. It doesn't get to that stage where it's going to be that bad. But the reality is, you just don't know. You really don't know. Uh, there's no way of telling. Um, what's the saying? Isn't the equation for interest rates inflation one one and a half times inflation times one and a half percent? I believe I believe it is. I mean, twelve and a half percent would be that would be very very that would be very very scary man and this is what i'm saying like you know you have to do everything within your power right now to ensure that you are going to be able to survive this from a personal finance point of view and look please let that marinate you have to do everything in your power to make sure that you are able to ride this storm out. I was speaking to a friend of mine um, on the way to the airport to here. And um, he's a good friend of mine. And he's actually thinking about basically giving back his car, selling his car and getting rid of the car payment. Well, he bought it by a personal loan. He's actually thinking of doing that, getting something smaller. He has some equity in the car anyway banking that money, using that as an emergency fund. And I talk a lot about emergency funds and making sure that people have got, you know, a bit of security. It's one of the the rules that I live by. I talk about it extensively in my book, but it's so important right now. The thing is, right, from a, from a very human point of view, and I've been there and it's hard to transition to it without being intentful, if you're in this situation and you're staring down the barrel of your mortgage going up two or three hundred pounds a month, which for a lot of people they are going to, it's very, the immediate feeling that you're going to feel is stress, panic, anxiety, and just a general sense of unease, right? And the mental health impact of that is huge because it impacts everything. It impacts how you go to work in the morning. It impacts whether you can sleep at night. It definitely impacts how you wake up in the morning, which can then, if you bring it back into the home and you have a family, interacts how you are with your partner, interacts with how you are with your kids, right? And this is this is all down to maybe choices that were made that were made in the right in the moment. And it, it's okay because we we all do that, right? We all like make a decision. It's like, oh, we, well, we deal with it later on, right? But now is the time to really be in, intentional and really start thinking about, look, how can I secure myself? Uh, look, an emergency fund is a great idea. I completely understand that. I mean, there is nobody on the planet that I speak to who doesn't understand that the idea of, a, of an emergency fund is common sense. We all 100% know that. The practicalities of building it, though, that's hard. It can be hard. And a lot of it is psychological. The first step is often the, the hardest thing. And the first step is you need to understand, look, how much do you need? How much do you already have? Do you have a head start? If you don't, then it's all about discipline and cutting away things that you don't need. And in the example of my friend, look, he's got a car he can sell where he's got probably about 15 Ks worth of equity in it. Sell it, buy something smaller, bank some money just to give himself a little bit of a cushion. I think now is the time for big boy decisions and big girl decisions. And we're just at that phase that it's better to do it now than to wait and think things are going to get better and try and do it in six months when, God forbid, things get even worse. There is no better time than the present. It's really, really important. And so, look, I hope we don't get to 12.5% interest rates because that would be game over for a lot of people. Um but a lot of this stuff is very much psychological. It's, it's, it's in moments like this that we have almost like awakenings, like epiphanies. Oh, my God. Like, you know, I, I'll give you a prime example. I, if, you, if you read my book, by the way, you, I, I share a lot of my own journey in my book. I talk about my struggles with debt and how, you know, I knew it was common sense. Yeah, I should build like some sort of emergency fund because what I used to do is I used to roll from credit card to credit card to credit card. And because I used to, I made the the, the stupid mistake, right? One credit card would be paid off or I'd transfer to a 0% balance transfer. Then I wouldn't get rid of the card that I just transferred from. I think, ah, 
I might need it for emergency. And in my mind, I'm still thinking, right, I should build up maybe like 200 quid, 300 quid as an emergency pot just so that I don't have to use this card. But I don't. Because in my head, I'll, at the time, I was like, okay, I might need it. Mm, I don't have enough money to be able to, you know, build a two, 300 pound uh, emergency fund on my own accord. And then obviously, the inevitable happens, I need to use that credit card again. So now I've got two credit cards, three credit cards, and I, it just escalated and escalated and escalated. And it the, the first step is so, so, so important. And a lot of it is having that moment of realization. And it's in moments like these that we do have them. And, you know, we are going to be in this situation again. We were here in 2007, 2008. Many people probably won't remember it or wouldn't have been in the position where, you know, they were responsible for their finances in the way that they are today. I mean, with responsibilities, i.e. they've got a mortgage, they've got kids, you know, they've got to send the kids to school. You know, it's all very well and good dealing with this when you're a single person with no responsibilities, because maybe you have people that you can call upon. When you have responsibilities, the things that you need to pay for, you're an adult making adult decisions, this can be really, really hard. And I always say to people, look, we will be here again. You know, 2007 was a long, long time ago, right? It's taken this long for us to get to this juncture again. And in between that, we've had a great time, low interest rates, buy whatever you want, cheap credit. We're now here. So what are we going to learn right now that is going to put us in the best position possible for when this next happens? Because it will happen again. It will just be called something different. It might be in a, come by way of a different mechanism, right? But what are we going to learn now and how can we put those foundations in place so that the next time this happens, be it, you know, five, six or even 10 years into the future, we will be in a better place at that point. You know, there is no point in us going through this now if we can't evolve and learn. And that's the most important thing. But 12 and a half percent interest rates are mad. Let's have a look at this. Brexit is a big reason. Yes, other countries have inflation, but Britain is the only country that chooses to impose economic sanctions on itself to make it much more difficult for the economy to recover. That's right. I mean, look, we do buy a, bot, a lot from the block. We have a lot of imports coming in. And all the time that our pound is suffering, that means that it's more expensive for us to import. That is inflation. It's inflationary. And so many people say, you know, Brexit gave us back our power and all that kind of stuff. Mm, maybe a little bit, but in, in the ways that matters, uh, there is a big debate to be had about that. Yeah, people are saying here, and just in terms of um, politicians, I don't think Rishi, uh, Rishi has a plan or cares. I wouldn't be, I mean, I, I think he, do I think he cares? I think he cares, but not probably as much as people would probably like him to. Look, you can't get away from the fact that he's very, very wealthy. And look, he's never gonna, this is never going to impact him personally. Like, you're never going to have to worry about paying his mortgage. Come on. He's got so much money. Like, at some point, money gets to the point where you feel insulated, secure. You do clever things with your money to make, like, you're not even, you're not even spending your capital at that level. At that level, your capital is working so hard for you. You're just living off interest and dividends and, and all this stuff. Like, it's almost like free living. Like the strategies that the wealthy people have to their at their disposal, it's just, you, you look at some of them and you're just like, how the fuck is this even, how, how are they able to do this? And not to mention that, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't even taxed anyway, which is what Gary on Gary's Economics talks about all the time. I 100% agree with him. It's a different world. And when you when people say he doesn't care, I think he cares, but I don't think he really cares because it's not going to impact him in the same way. Like, yeah, my mum is, you know, you come from the NHS, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. I mean, he was talking about, you know, um, not giving uh, public sector workers a pay rise. Do you know why that is? It's because that will be inflationary. It will make the situation worse. But what this is what they don't do. They don't articulate or explain things to us like adults. And if they did, I think that people would be a little bit more understanding because people aren't stupid. People understand, people have the capacity to understand, but they don't communicate it. And, and then the press doesn't necessarily do a great job because they want to infuriate people, Labour, conservative, Conservatives, the Green Party, whoever it is, they're going to use whatever they don't like or things that they see and think, oh, that's going to be a tr trigger for the public. Let's go to the tabloids with this soundbite. People really get enraged. I mean, 
I don't care who goes into government next, be it Labour, Lib Dems, Green Party, whoever. I don't think that any of them have a clue on how they're going to fix this. If I'm completely honest, none of them have a clue. Because Brexit, just thinking of Brexit, that's not going to be undone. So we're kind of like, you know, we're stuck with the new status quo right now. And unfortunately, the current status quo, given where we are right now, is inflationary to all of us. Yes, people, please do smash the like button. Zero, thank you so much for reminding people there, by the way. Let me just have a look and see uh, how many uh, likes we actually have. Again, likes just mean that after this is said and done, other people, the YouTube algorithm will be will push it to other people to, to listen to what we've spoken about here. Um, so please do smash the like button. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right, let's have a look at more of these, uh, these comments. Um, you seem extra stressed with this mortgage thing. I wouldn't say I'm extra stressed, but I I look at it and I, I definitely see what it's doing to my friends. Um, I'm in a lucky position where I have the ability, I'm going to pay off a large chunk of my mortgage just to kind of make sure that, you know, I can keep my costs down. And it's made me think again about my mortgage and whether I want to keep it and I'll probably be mortgage free in two years. I'm very, very lucky I'm in that position. But I've got friends who they're asking me like, how bad could it get? And I'm just, I'm having to say to them, like, guys, you need to, like, tighten your belts. You need to buckle up and be ready. It's better to be prepared for something coming down the track than not prepared and have it hit you like a tsunami. And so I'm seeing what he's doing to my mates and how stressed out my mates are. And that's why I, I feel really, really passionate about this. And that's why I'm covering a lot of it, because, you know, this is a really, really big deal. And it's going to be a, it's going to have a lot of it's going to have a big impact on a lot of people. Just started a regular overpayment, only £233 a month, but will uh, but will be 9K by the time my deal ends December 2026. Every little helps. Listen, that's really, really good, mate. You know, a 9K overpayment, that's going to save you. I don't know if you're using the Spribe, um, the Spribe app, but that will give you an estimation of how much interest it will it will save you. And you'll be surprised; it will save you more than that in interest and reduce down your mortgage term as well, mate. So it's a plan, mate. Well done. Evening, how are you doing? Joe's just saying, um, yeah, got a promotion at work, and I don't think I'll I'll even see that money. It is going to go on overpayments uh, to the max. Good man. Good man. I mean, there's a lot of conversations about overpaying mortgages right now, and I think it's definitely the way to go. Um, and yeah, look, for me, I'm going to be paying off so in the region of about 40 or well, 52, maybe 53,000. Like, don't get me wrong, like, it's painful. Like, 53K, like, that money was supposed to do something else, which I've had to make adjustments for. Um, it's painful, but look, it's going to a, towards a good cause. So every little bit that you can, is going to help in the long run. Uh, and just saying here, I'm currently fiercely saving and planning to pay off mortgage in four when my fixed rate ends in 2025. And I'll tell you what, how much of a great feeling is that going to be? That's, I, you know, I visualize quite a lot. And when I started thinking about, okay, well, if I pay off this here, it's going to have this much left of the mortgage. And over the next two years, I've got to work extremely hard over the next two years to pay off the balance. But I said, if it does actually happen, I kind of visualize what that might actually feel like. And just knowing, actually, you know what? I haven't got a mortgage. Just the peace of mind. And I think it will give me extra headspace to be able to be like, actually, you know what? I do want to do certain things or I don't want to do certain things. Like, I'm really lucky with work at the moment. Um, I'm in Dubai. I'm working. I'm exploring some opportunities out here, right? Um, so I'm really, really lucky in that vein. And I, I I pick and choose what I do. But to be in a position where I don't have a mortgage, that could for me be like, okay, I can really pick and choose what I do. I could maybe pursue some more passion projects more than anything else, do more work from a charitable point of view in schools and, and stuff. And just the idea of it actually is quite attractive to me. And I think that's that's the law for most people. It changes your mindset. It changes the way you see the world. It changes, it takes away the pressure, I guess. And, and that for me has definitely become something that I've become really attracted to um, over the past month or so, just thinking about this. So look, good luck to you, Anne. It's really, it's a great plan. 
I'm holding off my first time buyer um, for the next few years. So just hoping for better savings rates to come along. Luke, if you haven't watched the live on Sunday, mate, go and look at the live on Sunday because, you know, I asked Charlie this question and Charlie's got 25 years experience in property. And he gave some really thoughtful answers and things that are worthwhile considering um, as a first time buyer looking to buy in this market. Um, so definitely go watch that because it's definitely worthwhile. It's a bit long, but you can skip to get to where you need to. But he dropped some gems, mate. He really, really did. Question. Uh, if the housing market crashes, what year do you think values will go back to 20, uh, 20, uh, 20, 2008? Um, mate, I don't know. I mean, I follow mainly the stock market. The stock market in 2007, 2008 fell, what, 51% roughly? Um, and it's recovered handsomely from then. I mean, way, way over and beyond. I don't know what the property market did um, back in 2007, 2008. I mean, Charlie's thoughts are that we'll see a 35% dip in the property market. And we're already about 10% down already. So there's still a fair way to go. Uh, I don't know how that compares to 2007, 2008, though. So I couldn't really answer that question because probably is not really my thing. One thing I was thinking about doing was getting some of the guys from uh, Right Move on. They've got a, a data, uh, they, they, he calls himself a data scientist, but basically what he does, he looks at all of the data around uh, property prices. Um, and then he kind of has a view of where things are going to go. I was going to try and get him on the channel, but we've been trying to organize this now for like two months and just our schedule just just keep clashing. So I'm going to keep trying on that. He might be a good person to ask uh, that question to. Um, let's have a look here. There's another question from you. You're asking, is interest, <clears throat> is interest only or extending the deal a good idea? Okay, right. So look, I am a mortgage advisor. I'm a qualified mortgage advisor, but I don't advise anymore. So don't take this as, as advice. But I'm, I can't give you advice because I don't know your situation. But I can tell you that I, I'll tell you how I would approach it and what I think. If you go interest only, you will definitely save on your monthly payments for sure. So if you're paying, I don't know, 500 quid a month at the moment, you might see that it goes down to 300 quid. So you're saving like 200 quid, right? The danger with that is this. First and foremost, you're only paying the interest for the period of time that you go interest only. So let's say you go interest only for a year. You're only paying the interest for a year, which means you haven't paid down any of your capital, which essentially means that, well, your, your term potentially becomes longer or you increase your payments after the, that period that you've chosen ends. Those are the two options you have. Whereas if you go with, you know, extending your deal, as the first and preferred option, well, you're gonna pay more interest in the long run, but you're still paying down the capital over that period of time. So you'd have to crunch the numbers specifically. And without knowing your details, I wouldn't be able to do that for you. You'd have to crunch the numbers. What impact does it have in terms of the, more, the interest that you pay on your mortgage? Knowing those numbers outright, I think would be a, a really good way to make an informed decision. But my gut feel would be to go, would be to extend the term rather than go interest only. Purely because I've seen people go interest only. And because, look, life gets busy, it's natural, it's normal. You forget, oh, it's interest only. And maybe you just renew without really looking at the paperwork. You then renew onto an interest only. And then you're an interest only for three, four years. That is a real trap that a lot of people fall into. And I just think that if you're not the kind of person that, will actively look at it and pay attention to it. It's just better to avoid that that possibility of being stuck or left on an interest-only mortgage through no fault of your own, just the fact that you got busy um, and just extend the term. That's that's how I think of it. But like I said, these things, you probably want to take advice properly so you can see what the interest numbers are and how it impacts your mortgage over the term and, and actually take some advice from a mortgage broker. Someone's saying, if you're still in a, in a fixed rate mortgage, can you extend the number of years or change it to a fixed rate? You can extend the term of your overall mortgage. You can do that. So you need to speak to your broker. You need to speak to your lender to see what that actually looks like in terms of practicalities. But you, you need to have a conversation with someone first. You can extend the, the, the term, the length of your mortgage for sure. But if you're fixing a two-year fixed rate, you can't then go 
move it to like a three year fix without paying an early repayment charge because you're breaking the terms of that agreement that you have in that two year fixed. So you can't go from a two, maybe a three to three without, you know, signing up to something new and paying a penalty. So, but have a conversation. You can definitely extend the the overall term of your mortgage. That, that's no issue. Just one word of warning though, for, for people who may be like in their forties, late forties, maybe fifties, looking to extend the term of their mortgage. If your mortgage ends beyond your retirement date, so when you first took out the mortgage, you would have said, I intend to retire at 66, whatever, right? If your mortgage ends after that date that you've said, they'll want to know whether you have adequate um, pensions in place, retirement planning to give you an income so that you can pay the mortgage. And sometimes for some people that can be an issue um, if you haven't got any pension provisions in place already. So just a just a heads up. Uh, Zero is asking here: Is my emergency fund still nine k? And where do you hold it? My emergency fund is a lot is a lot larger than that. Um, it's a lot it's a lot lot larger than that. Um, and I've held it in a savings account. I've held it in an instant access savings account the entire time, purely because with an emergency fund, I want to be able to get access to it immediately. Um, and so for me, when interest rates were low. I didn't really mind the fact that it wasn't getting any any interest, but my my emergency fund is significantly higher than nine than nine grand. Matthew's just saying here, like Luke, um, putting off uh, buying uh, just to the rate, just to the just due to the rate uncertainty, just continue saving as much as I possibly can. We did say on Sunday, look now, if you're able to get in, like into a mortgage with the largest deposit possible, try and do that. And it could be an opportune time because I asked Charlie, what, you know, what were the opportunities of first time buyers? And his view was like, you know, if property prices are here and they're heading downwards, but you've got a large deposit or you're saving up to a large deposit, well, that could work in your favor because probably the values are coming down. So if you've got a, you know, a large deposit, that means that your loan to value is going to be really, really attractive. Not, number one, not only are you you're going to get a better rate because you've got a bigger deposit and a, and a lower loan to value, but actually you're probably going to be able to buy a property that was formerly outside of your shopping bracket, right, in terms of price uh, bracket. So, yeah, look, if you can, save as much of the as a, of deposit as you can that would be brilliant um so yeah really good move mate thanks there's a good conversation between you and luke going on there um let's have a look at this one from c unfortunately we haven't seen the full effects of brexit yet food prices will increase by at least 10 percent as soon as the full physical and document uh, documentary checks come into ports this is the only beginning. I'm, I fear that you might be a little bit right there as well, mate. Good conversation between Matthew and Luke. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, someone's saying here that um, Europe is a mess as well, especially Germany. Global recession is eminent. You know what? Um, on on this, this is a, that's a really good call, actually. Let me see if I can actually just find, find uh, where are we? I've shrunk this uh, window just so I can fit this in. Let me just see if I can find some data on uh, on Germany. It might be another a separate video. Just see how we actually compare at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, look. So let me just share this quickly. Have a look at this. So this is uh, Germany right now. So their inflation at the moment, I mean... What have I just done? Yeah, so yeah, their interest rates at the minute, they're at 4% interest rates. Um, their inflation is lower than ours, though. It's 6.1 at the moment. I mean, I think we've got the highest inflation in Europe. We've got the highest. I think, be, aside from countries like, at least the last time I checked, which was a few months ago, aside from countries like Turkey, Turkey definitely had a, a higher inflation rate than ours. And someone else had a had a higher inflation rate than ours, but Germany six point four. They're forecasting what Q three here four percent, uh, three point six, then three percent in um, in Q one of twenty twenty four. I don't know what their target um, inflation rate is though. 
ours is 2%. I don't know what theirs are, but I might do a video, just do a little bit of a comparison between the UK and Germany. But yeah, I mean, we are, we're not alone in the fact that there is inflation everywhere. I just think we're, we're, we're worst. We're worse than a lot of other countries at the moment. Uh, the Northern Rock 120% mortgage and bank runs. Yeah, I mean, that was a disaster. <laughs> that, that, I laugh now, but that was a disaster. At the time, I was working for NatWest, RBS, and literally, um, I was in Tunbridge Wells. I was working in the Tunbridge Wells branch at the time um, by Mount Ephraim. And, um, oh, my God, I remember this morning, we, me and Mike, we went into work. I dropped Mike off. I went up to to work because he, he worked down the uh, pan tiles. Went up to work. The door wasn't open. And we waited for like 15 minutes for the door to open. And the manager finally let us in. And it was like, we almost didn't open our doors today. It was that. It was that close. It was that close. It was really, really, really bad. So... I've got first mortgage coming in, coming up in February. Don't know how to ex, uh, what to expect. Currently at three point seven five percent. So where are you? February, 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 February. Where are we right now? We're in July. Mm, no, we're in June. Mm. Yeah. So what you want to do? You want to be counting six months down. Six months. Uh, six months before February, you can start to look around for deals. So I think actually. July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, mm, you're still a way off at the moment. So I think you're probably going to be, it will be August, September that you can start looking around for a new rate and possibly get yourself locked in for something new. Hopefully interest rates haven't moved that bad. I mean, we're talking about the next uh, monetary policy committee meeting being on August the 3rd. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really, really tricky one. Look, just pay attention to the news, see what's going on, keep your ear to the ground, try not to panic too much. But where you can, reduce expenses as much as you possibly can. Um, and if you're able to get a pot of money, it doesn't matter whether it's a grand or two, just to kind of, you know, throw it into the mortgage so you're borrowing less at the time, th every little bit will help, basically. But just try and make sure that from a personal finance point of view, you've got a, as much of it locked down as you possibly can. Uh, disgruntled of London. Um, at the end of the day, after over a decade of QE, the, the government is pushing QT. Unfortunately, it will be the uh, mostly homeowners in London, the South, who will see money wiped off the value of their homes. I think that's not just in London. I mean, London and the South will definitely feel it a lot more than other places, but people are, across the country who are homeowners are going to see it for sure. It's just going to be felt differently because it's all it's all proportionate, right? Um, it's all relative. So yeah, people are going to feel it. People are definitely going to feel it. All right, this is a good question. So Luke's saying here, I don't, what I don't understand is why landlords are exiting the market. Uh, surely high demand would keep landlords speculating. Not that I want them to, just trying to understand the direction of travel. So for landlords, right? So there was something called... Um, Section 24. If try and explain this in the best way that I can, according to the way I understand this, I may not get this 100% right. But previously, what would happen is if you had a, if you owned a property, right? And let's just say you were renting this place out for a thousand pounds a month, right? Now, let's just assume that your mortgage payment was 500 pounds of that. And then maybe you had like a hundred pounds extra like expenses and stuff, right? So your expenses is 600 quid, your profit is 400 quid. What used to happen was that as a landlord, you would pay tax on 400 quid. Now under section 24, what the government basically did is they said, well, actually your mortgage payment, you can't, you can't net that off anymore. So now you've got a thousand pounds that you rented this property out for, your expenses are hundred quid, so because you can't claim 500 quid for your mortgage and not pay tax on that, now you've got to pay tax on 900 pounds. That's why. Now, when you combine that with the fact that interest rates have gone up, a lot of them haven't been able to pass it on to their tenants or they can't pass it on to their tenants because the tenants can't afford it. A lot of landlords are running properties at a loss. 
and they're just thinking now that actually, hang on a second, this doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, I'm going to sell up. And the unfortunate thing is that depending on obviously where these properties are being sold, you're going to have a lot of investors pick these up who are going to convert maybe a three three bedroom home into like a a four bed HMO house of multiple occupancy. So they're taking that ends up being that you know family homes get taken out of the market, turned into rents where they can max it where someone a new landlord a property investor can maximize the rental income on that property. That isn't necessarily good. Um, and so look, it's it's a really really. For years, people have been told to do the right thing, to buy property has been this kind of like golden egg, right? This this resort, this last thing that you can put money into that will give you a good income. It's it's turned out to be increasingly not the case more recently. And that's why landlords are exiting, because they're just thinking, look, if I can't rent it out for a profit and I've got cost coming in and I'm having to pay more tax, what's the point? And to a certain extent, you, you could you could argue that that's what the government has been planning to do over the last two, three years, to squeeze landlords to the point where they put the properties on the market because they need that. They need those properties to go to first time buyers. But the reality is the deposits are too high for them to go to first time buyers, depending on where they're being, you know, where they're being sold. Probably other property investors pick it up. So it's not actually ended up in the hands of first time buyers anyway. It's just a really convoluted, really nasty cycle. Also, the end of the end of uh, free movement immigration will reduce um, from EU member states. In the past years, wages were suppressed, but now people demanding ten percent plus wage increases adding to inflationary pressure. That is true, one hundred percent, because it is fact that you would have uh, Eastern Europeans or you know just people from from Europe wanting to work here because they would work here, send money home, and they wouldn't mind, they're hard workers, they wouldn't mind working for a little bit less. That is very, very true. And if we're now looking at um, giving it to people who are local, well, unfortunately, a lot of people don't want to work for five, six pounds an hour. They want 10 pounds an hour, you know? And if that is going to be the new, the new benchmark, obviously that has to be passed on to customers in some way, shape or form. And that is inflationary because you, the business isn't going to eat the cost of that. It has to be passed on to consumers. Uh, Claus Schwab and the Squanish of the WEF have begun their plans of your own nothing and uh, have no privacy and be happy. Eh, I don't know about that. We'll see. Not that I'm dismissing the World Economic Forum, but I think when you read into it, <clears throat> people will argue that it's it's an evil agenda. I don't see it that way. I think there are some really, some of the stuff that they're talking about is actually really good. And that's a completely different video in itself. Um, I think there's a lot of people who are, they see these organizations as being all evil and having a, an evil agenda. And I just don't see the world in that way. I think that's a really horrible way to, to go through life, thinking that everybody has an agenda against you. And I just think you, 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 you in my opinion, you can't, you can't do that. You just can't exist like that. You just put in too many mental barriers and, and things in your own way. All right, where was I? I'm just looking at the, the comments. I appreciate all the engagement on this. Um, I'm just trying to find where I am just to see how much I actually have or how many comments I have that I've not been able to get to um, because there is a lot. Um, there is a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, Apologies, guys, if I don't get to all of this. I'm also looking at the time. We're coming up on an hour, and I thought this was going to be like 10, 15 minutes. Um, right, that's where I am. The, yeah, there's quite a few. I'll power through um, a few more, uh, see what we can get. Uh, you may see this as a conspiracy theory. The banks increase rates extremely quickly, far too fast. Mm. No, they don't, mate. I mean, look, I've worked in banking for 15 years and I can explain it, but people don't necessarily want to want to hear the truth either. So if you think about the bank, the bank is a business. Yeah. So what they're passing on is the cost of debt. Right. So they have to borrow money at a cost. So, OK, let's put it this way. Right. Let's just say you run a loan company where you're loaning money out to people. 
So you go and get money from an organization and they say, right, um, Ma, you, we're going to lend it to you at 1%, right? Now you need to make money on this bow that you've lent at one, this money that you borrowed at, at 1%, right? So you lend it out at 1.5%. Now let's just say next week when you go back to borrow some more money because you've, you've, you've lent out all the money that they gave you at 1%, you want to go borrow some more money, they now say, okay, we're going to lend it to you at 2%. So are you now going to take that money and go lend it to people at the one and a half percent that you were doing before? No, you were not going to. You're going to have to lend it to them at two plus, right? Because you're getting at one percent. Your margin may require that you have to lend it out at two and a half percent. Because otherwise, if you didn't, you go out of business. That's exactly what it's like for banks, mate. People think that banks just do this to be evil. It's a business at the end of the day. And this is why I need to make this video about why banks cannot help mortgage holders, even if they wanted to. They are a business. If they lent money at 2% and gave it out at 1%, their business is gone. And guess what happens when the when the banks are gone? Why do you think the government bailed out the banks in 2007, 2008? Because the fallout is catastrophic. And you may think that it doesn't impact you, but trust me, it impacts everything. The fabric of reality as we know it in Western society is built upon everything. The house you live in, the car you drive, the cars you, you, you wear, everything is interconnected. Everything is intertwined with the banks. And I will make this video, actually, because it's worthwhile explaining, because people just think, oh, they, they pass on the rates way too quickly. They're being evil. No, they're not. If they don't, they don't have a business. They're not profitable. They can't employ people. When they can't employ people, people lose their homes. People lose their houses. That means that then businesses go bust because guess what? The bank's not making any money to provide the services they're providing. It is it's it is a conspiracy theory, mate. I'm sorry to break it to you, but it is. And that's simply because of the way the world works. It's a business at the end of the day. I mean, if you would run a loan company and give, you know, borrow money at 2% and give it to people at 1.5%, then, hey, listen, be my guest. You're welcome. I think due to the due to a lot of tax breaks um, ending for landlords, those with smaller portfolios, it's simple, uh, not worth it. Yeah, simply not worth it anymore. Absolutely. What's the app called for overpayments? It's called Sprive. So it's S P R I V E Sprive. Um, I did a live with um, the founder of Sprive about three weeks ago um the video that you need to go look for it was it was streamed on a sunday i think the uh the thumbnail says overpay mortgages overpay your mortgage or something like that is what it's called what the thumbnail said if you go watch that video and scan the qr code so i've got a qr code uh here right no here I've got a QR code literally right there. That's a QR code for my book. There is a QR code on that video, which will give you five pounds. So they will donate five pounds for you trying the app. You can't take the five pounds out, but you can use it to pay towards your mortgage. That's an overpayment, but it's really, really cool. If you go find that video, go and scan that, that QR code. That's a little gift uh, from me. Good conversation going on there as well. Um, Mm. Someone's just saying, I'm a property owner with five properties uh, all rented out. It's getting more expensive with some extra costs due to EI and EPC, more regulatory burden. So I understand why some are exiting. There we go. Right from a landlord right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they were the app. So it's Sprive. So P, uh, S P S P R I V E, Sprive. Someone saying, hey, I'm overpaying £1,000 a month. The mortgage counter is telling me I'll save £11,000 over the next 12 months. Is the mortgage calculator the best way to use or do you use something different? The mortgage calculator, they have an interest calculator in um, Sprive, which is very, very good as well. So you can use the one there. But there's a number of them on, um, 
on like some of the lenders' websites, they have quite a few on there that you can use. There are definitely a load of um, overpayment calculators online as well. But the one in Spribe, it allows you to play around. Because a lot of people think that you've got to have a lump sum to pay off, a, like do an overpayment on your mortgage, and you don't. You can pay off five quid, 10 quid, 15 quid over there. And it's, it's quite powerful when you realize, well, that 50 quid extra that you're paying per month ends up being something like 3,000 pounds. It's like, your mind just goes. And again, look, going back to the question of why the banks can't do it, when you look at it from the cold facts of how much money they make off mortgages, yes, it's going to piss you off. And it pisses me off as well, right? Because if you look at the lifetime of a mortgage, if you borrow 200 grand, you're probably paying 200 grand over the lifetime of your mortgage. And then they amortize your mortgage, which means that you're paying majority of your interest, like the majority of your payments on a monthly basis when you first start at your mortgage, probably about 90% of it goes towards your interest. You don't actually start paying down your capital until you're well into your mortgage. That pisses me off. Like, it will piss anybody off. And this is what I said this on a, on a Instagram live, uh, Instagram reels, like beyond just dismantling Western society and capitalism, I don't know how we change any of this stuff because uh, it, when you really think about it, you're just like, why do we do things the way we do? Why? Why do we do it in the way that we do? But hey, that's that's way above my my intellectual capacity and it's way beyond my my ability to be able to articulate or even begin to look into it's it's pretty messed up when you look at it that way it really really is all right so many comments guys i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry i can't get through them all um it's just over an hour now and i like to keep these to around about an hour or so if i can help it but i'm looking at the view account and there's been a a, a lot of you on here consistently for the last hour. I wasn't really too sure whether or not this was gonna be seen as a good thing or I didn't, wasn't even too sure what I should come and actually talk about this, but I just wanna make, I guess, content that will help people. And, you know, this is something that I think is an important factor to bear in mind over the next 36 days or so. Um, and so that we can be prepared, right? Um, and judging by the engagement, um, I want to say thank you to everyone. I really do appreciate it. Um, if you haven't smashed the like button, this is going to be my last ask. If you haven't smashed the like, like button, please do. Again, it take you just one second. There's 51 likes on there at the moment. There's over 100 of you on here at the minute. If we get to 80 or so, that would be amazing. It takes one second. But it just means that for people who also may need to see this and you know, learn from what we've spoken about here this evening, the YouTube algorithm will recommend it to other people just by that simple action of tapping that like button. So please do that for me. Really, really do appreciate you for being here on a Tuesday evening. I'm in Dubai here until uh, I fly back on Sunday. Um, and so over the next couple of days, if something does pop up, I'll do another one of these. It might be in here, it might be somewhere else. I'm not too sure just yet. Um, but I will just obviously try to keep everyone up to date and um, be as helpful as possible. But I guess, look, whatever you do this evening, um, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate every single one of you, and I will catch you later on. Yeah, surprise, a little different than you're used to. Yeah. Dropping these bars on YouTube, knowledge I introduce you. Yeah. We chasing this money like it's the prize, it's the voodoo. From Gazy for Gazi, it's just a lie we buying into. Ah. We need some cars on deck Get the roadies, get the mowing All the Mars on deck We got the traders Got the picture with the Bentley in Dubai Are you dripping in designer looking fly On the bombardier sipping on the wine Broke man, we broke Where's the fun in being broke? Stocks and bonds get you yoked That's what I'm teaching these folks I see that smoke, see them choke Getting coke, getting coke While I'm researching these stocks Buying coke, buying coke 20 months on the channel Million people taking note I got a warrant for buffet I'm coming for his folks